Thank you very much for, for the kind introduction and also for the, for the opportunity to present um, part of my work here. And I'm very happy to, to talk tonight about um, the topic, should we just build more homes um, to combat rising rents and, and rising prices? And so in case you have questions, uh, just please feel free to interrupt at any time. Uh, we can discuss while I'm talking, I can stop, stop and, and you can ask your questions and we can start the discussion right there. Uh, or we can, can also um, discuss afterwards. So in case anything is unclear, just let me know and I'll, I'll stop and try to answer your questions. So I'm, I'm working at the moment in the um, research project who benefit, benefits from new housing supply where I, I look particularly at the question whether building more homes helps renters and uh, whether it helps renters across the rent distribution or whether it just helps renters that live in very expensive units. And so that's um, the, the core of, of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, and, but I'll start my presentation with some stylized facts, some information about how rents and prices have developed in the, in the last years in, in Germany and elsewhere. Okay, so in Germany, uh, rents and house prices have increased strongly uh, since 2010. And before that, uh, that may be also an interesting uh, fact, Germany was an outlier in international comparison. So we didn't have strong price increases rather than that we had decreasing real prices uh, for, for an extended period of time. And only in 2010, um, prices and, and also rents have started to increase. And, and since then relatively steeply, in particularly in the, in, in the bigger cities. And uh, that also applies to, to the rents. However, if you look at the scales of these two graphs, uh, rent, the rent increases were not as strong as the, as the price increases. And, and these are nominal increases. So you'd have to uh, take into account that prices have, of other goods have increased as well. So the real increase in, in rents relative to other goods was a bit uh, smaller, smaller than what I'm just showing here. So you can see that the dashed line is the, is the CPI uh, that has also increased a bit obviously over that period. But still in, in the big cities, um, prices and rents have increased uh, pretty strongly and, and more than in the countryside. Uh, then let me, uh, as a second fact, uh, show you some graphs that, sh that uh, show that the price increases and, and here the, the rent increases weren't um, similarly strongly in all places. So uh, this one is, is Nuremberg, uh, where we have seen since 2012 about a 40% increase uh, in nominal terms. Um, in Berlin, it was even above that. So 50% increase in nominal terms. Um, and, but if you look into smaller, smaller cities, more re remote places, uh, Biden is, is a good example because it's not so far from Nuremberg, but it's a relatively remote place uh, with less employment opportunities, less attractive probably overall. And there the increase was only about 20%, which is much, much closer to the CPI increase over that time. So the, the nominal rent increase was basically uh, very similar to the overall price increase. So rents haven't um, increased that much relative to the prices of other goods. And the same applies even more, uh, more so for Cottbus, which is uh, probably a good comparison with Berlin because it's, it's not far from Berlin, but it's, it's also much more remote. And there um, the, the rent increase was even less. Okay, so um, in a similar direction, the housing expenditure share, so how much of your income do you spend on housing? Um, increases, as, well, sorry, uh, decreases with your income. So if you have a high income, uh, renters typically spend a smaller share of their income on housing. Uh, and and in, uh, well, households that don't have a very high income sometimes spend 30, 40, even 50% of their incomes on, on housing. And this is uh, even more pronounced in the big cities. So here again, Berlin has, 
a slightly higher uh, well, expenditure share uh, throughout this distribution and then uh, mecklenburg vorpommern which is um, which hasn't seen these, these strong rent increases okay so um, one thing i already mentioned um, but that is also pretty interesting because it's it's uh, widespread not only in germany house prices have increased much more strongly than than rents and so this is the ratio of uh, prices to rents and as you can see again in the big cities this ratio has increased much more um, than in germany overall and it has increased um, or has started to increase when prices and rents started to increase and so a few reasons for this um, are favorable favorable financing conditions um, low interest rates in particular and so credit is available for, for households who want to buy. Um, but then also expectations about future local housing demand. So if I think that in the future, Berlin and Munich and, and Hamburg and so on, these kinds of places are going to, to stay attractive or become even more attractive, then I am expecting also that, that rents are probably going to increase further in these places. And so I might be, be willing to pay a bit more uh, for for a real estate in these cities. Um, so, and, and this applies to these big cities. So these are locations where employment opportunities um, are probably going to, to improve over time. And, and these places are still becoming more attractive. And this is a very interesting topic at the moment also because of, of the pandemic and these effects of, of well, being able to work from home. And uh, so that's something that is res research at the moment and where people are maybe not um, yet clear whether that's going to, 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 to make these uh, big places less attractive or, or um, maybe even more attractive. Uh, but, but that's maybe something that is affected by the pandemic. Uh, but apart from, from the pandemic, uh, over these past 10 years or so, uh, this was the case that these places have increased or have gained attractiveness and, and have um, become more populous and so on. Okay, and, and then the reverse is true for these declining locations in Germany. This uh, could, for instance, be the Ruhr, Ruhrgebiet and, and also um, parts of Eastern Germany where people are moving away um, to move to these bigger cities. Um, interestingly, this is true for almost all OECD countries that um, during these um, housing booms, the ratio of prices to rents increased and, and quite dramatically in some places. Um, so again, these favorable financing conditions could explain this, but then um, there's also a strong cyclical pattern that is related to these boom bust cycles. So. Uh, um, as you probably remember, in 2007, we had the great financial crisis with uh, strongly increasing house prices before that in many countries, and then a, a bust after that, and, and then a recovery. And this ratio of prices to rents also increased um, in, in a similar way than, uh, than the prices. Um, then an important uh, thing to, or an interesting bit about this graph is also that Canada and Great Britain are at the top of the graph. And well, these two countries are former Commonwealth countries. And what they um, have in common is that, or apart from maybe other things, uh, they have very severe planning regulation. So it's very difficult in these countries, like, as compared to other countries, to build new housing. And this could be part of the reason why People think, well, if demand increases over time and, and it's going to be difficult to build additional housing units, probably um, prices are going to increase in the future. And, and, and that's why they, they are willing to pay uh, quite a lot for, for these houses, even though the rents are maybe, um, maybe haven't increased that much. Then there are two outliers, as you might have noticed, uh, Germany, which has only started to increase in this graph um, as we've already seen about 2010 and maybe part of the reason for this is that Germany has a very large rental market uh, that might um, just lead to different effects than in these other countries where the homeowner 
market is much larger. And then Japan uh, had a, has a declining population, and, and this could also be um, well, part of, of that story that people in Japan might expect that in the future, there are even less uh, people living in Japan, and so demand for housing is going to decrease overall. Um, so it might not be that um, might not be a great idea to invest in, in real estate in Japan today, and, and so prices have to be lower. Okay, so and, and then another interesting um, stylized fact is that these price to rent ratios um, tend to increase much more in the superstar cities of these countries. Uh, so looking at, at, at England and London, uh, at least since the great financial crisis, London has seen a much stronger increase than England overall. Then in the US, it's super uh, pronounced. In the US as compared to New York City. Uh, in New York City, prices have increased about twice as strongly as rents. In the US, they were, well, prices increased a bit more than rents only. Uh, France and Paris, similar pattern than in London and England. And then Japan and Tokyo. So Tokyo has seen an increase in the price to rent ratio. So prices have increased more than rents, uh, despite the fact that the Japanese population has shrunk in the same over the same time. And um, this is because the population of Tokyo has increased uh, still. So this just shows that these superstar cities and very very large cities now uh, have become and continue to to be a very attractive places where many, many people want to live because probably because of the employment opportunities and then also because of amenities of, of things you can do in these big cities. Okay, well, and then um, using the UK as an example, um, if you look at the number of new housing units that has been constructed per year, and at the house price index, uh, for the UK, this is, is a very, very um, well, telling picture, I think. Uh, in, if, if you compare everything to the level of 1970, and the new housing units completed per year are only at the level of 50% of what was completed in 1970. Um, so a, a relatively low, um, Number of units, small number of units is completed each year. And, uh, but if you look at house prices, house prices over the same period have tripled or more than, than tripled. And this is real house prices. So it means that house, housing has become three times as expensive as it was in 1970, which is a super strong increase. And so one conjecture, con conjecture from, from this picture could be, well, uh, maybe, the strong increase in house prices is mainly driven by this lack of supply. And, and this is one of the things I, I want to argue today that, that this is indeed true and, and that more supply, more new housing units would help a lot to, to bring down prices and also to bring down rents. And so for Germany, based on, on my own work, um, I've tried to calculate what is the additional number of housing units that would have been uh, required to keep rents constant in these cities. And so this is built on, or this is based on, on the results from, from my research project uh, that I'm working on at the moment. And so you can see on the vertical axis, the average yearly rent growth 2011 until 2018. And on the horizontal axis, uh, how much additional units would have uh, to be built to bring each of these cities to the zero line on the vertical axis. So to, to have them to, to kill all of the um, real rent increase. And so well, one city that sticks out here is, is Munich because it has the largest uh, yearly real rent increase over that period with almost 5% per year. Uh, which is really, really strong. Uh, if you think about um, also how much of your income you spend on housing. So if you have to pay 5% more each year, that can, can become uh, quite a lot uh, really quickly. 
Uh, so for Munich, um, this calculation suggests that they should have built 20% more than what they actually built over that um, period. Um, so it, it suggests that they have built quite a bit of housing, uh, but also the, I, I think the demand increase over that time. So the number of people that moved to, to Munich was just very, very large. The Berlin is also up here. Um, probably they, they built a, a bit less than Munich even in relative terms, should have built 40% more than what they, they actually built. But then also we have some cities down here and I want to meant for point to Frankfurt and Hamburg as two examples that are also mentioned quite often in, in the media for places where rents and prices are super high. Well, actually, in, over this boom, the, the past 10 years, they have managed to keep rents relatively low. So the rent increase was um, below 1% a year. Now, I'm not saying that the rents are low in these places, but, but this is a, a huge difference to, to these places I was just referring to, to Munich and Berlin. And if you think about how the city of Frankfurt looks like, and also if you think about what types of buildings you can find in Hamburg, uh, well, Frankfurt is known for to have the only skyline in, in Germany, and Hamburg also has quite a few social housing buildings and, and large apartment buildings. Um, that just can house a lot of people. And, and so I think this is a, a very big difference in particular to, to Munich where we have very few of these um, buildings and we don't have high rise um, construction in, in Munich at all. Okay, and then a number of just to, to mention it is in the middle here. So we've also seen quite a substantial rent increase um, and we have well, Nuremberg has built some new housing, but should have built more, obviously, to bring down bring down um, rents. Sorry, okay. I'm going to interrupt you. Just a, yeah. have a question, uh, just to understand at this point. So, for the example of Frankfurt and Hamburg, then, so it does. You say that they managed to keep uh, somehow the um, the rents relatively low. Uh, so it's not just a matter of. Uh, uh, building sometimes more houses, but also which type of house you build, right? Uh, I mean, because you may be yes. a skyline, so it's a different concept and it's not suitable for all the cities, maybe. Yes, well, I'm, I'm just trying to say that they allow um, for, for buildings that are what well, that maybe suit better the needs of these large cities because, well, the, the land is very expensive in these cities and. If you're just allowed to build a two-story house in, in the middle of Munich, um, each unit has to cost a fortune for the developer to make a profit. And well, But if you're allowed to build uh, 30 stories, then you can have a lot more units in that same building on the same footprint, the same plot of land. And um, each unit can be much cheaper. So that, that's all I'm trying to say. So, yes, and restricting the type of buildings too much uh, can lead to fewer houses being, being built or just to fewer, fewer units, maybe and that's a better way of, of saying it. So the number of, of buildings might be the same, but the number of units that, that is being built uh, is going to be much smaller. And so, sorry, Andres, I was so just a consideration, like, do you also consider uh, uh, the increase of the size of the city? So, or you keep uh, the size of the city constant in your analysis? So the spatial? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. It is constant. That's the same order of, of the municipality. But what I, I don't have in this graph, so what is something that where uh, the cities differ, uh, some of these cities have seen very strong increases in, in population and others haven't. And that also obviously explains how much uh, rents go up. And so that's why some of these cities are um, way above this uh, 45 degree line and, and some of the cities are below it um, because well, Munich is a good example. They have seen very, very strong demand increases, a lot more people moving to Munich. And Duisburg has seen a loss of population rather than an increase. 
Sorry, Andrea, I have the last uh, question for this slide. Um, but uh, this uh, graph uh, is not uh, helping us to have a prediction. What do you think? So, for instance, if I see this, uh, that is uh, mm -hmm. considering an average in the last... Uh, yes, um, may I use uh, or may I have uh, like an idea or... Uh, or this will be not uh, suitable for a prediction? Well, so um, for a prediction, I, I don't know. But to, to make well, to make plausible what, what these cities sh should have done or how many buildings are missing, how many more buildings they should build, I think there is informative. Um, because it's, it's, it's based on an actual estimation of, of how much uh, rents go down if I increase the number of buildings in that city. Okay. I agree. I'm going to come to, to these results in a, in, in a minute, yeah. Yeah, I agree with you, Andreas, because I know some cities very good. Um, perhaps for explanation, I'm a financial consultant, so uh, my job is to sell housings for, do you know, for, for rent for people. Mm -hmm. And in Leipzig, indeed, we made a vast of um, new housings or uh, how do you say, sanierung, you know, not construction, mm -hmm. but and not really like redevelopment or redevelopment. Yeah. And so I know that this market is because there's so many housings, it's quite decent. But in Berlin, you see uh, with the Smietendeckel, this rent uh, closure that works uh, not at all, no? Mm -hmm. Uh, and and uh, I I know that the last two years the most companies didn't build or uh, redevelop areas there in Berlin because it was so politically unstable. But my question to this graph is, why the fuck is Heidelberg <laughs> so low? I know it is a very 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 expensive city, and your graph says, oh, it's everything okay, and they should decrease decrease more or less their housings. I don't understand. Well, so I just looked at my data and in my data, the real rent increase over that period was just zero. So their rents were stable. Okay, that's um, it. It doesn't say anything about the levels. Yeah. So it, 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 yeah. Hamburg has high rents by any um, comparison, but, but the, inc the change, um, According to my data, the, the change was, was pretty much zero. So, so I think should... the inflation. Yeah. Okay. So I think it's a, an indicator for an investor. Perhaps he should buy in Erfurt and in Magdeburg and in Heidelberg from your graph because it's or in Frankfurt because it's below it's below this average uh, um, building rebuilding or new buildings. It would be better yes. to, to buy there than uh, to buy in Munich or Augsburg and hope for raising prices. Yeah, so as I said, what, what is missing in this graph uh, is the, the demand side. So how many people want to live in these cities? And that probably also plays a role for the investor, whether, whether they should invest in, in that city or in, an, in another city. Um, so, uh, uh, I'm not so sure about because I think um, that we are talking about Germany here and more or less the, the population and the demand. Of course, there are focus points, but the, the, the population in all is more or less stable. Yeah. We don't have this increase. Okay. This increase no, we don't have these. I don't know, uh, this uh, uh, migration and this uh, new burn uh, uh, people to raise the prices. I think the demand is just uh, locally focused, but not overall. Yes, but I that's think... what I'm saying. So the demand, more people move to Munich, um, but people move away from, from Magdeburg, maybe. I, I'm, I'm not sure about this, but that's not in the graph. So that could be part of why places are above the line or, or below. Thanks very much. Okay. Very yeah, thank you for the, for the questions. Um, so I'll, I'll go on um, with two questions. So do we need to build multifamily housing in order um, to 
review trends. So that's, I think, an important question because people tend, well, at least in, in public debate, people tend to, to argue that, or seem to argue sometimes that uh, we need to build specific types of housing in order to reduce rents. And, and then a related question, how does it help a low income household if I build a new house that where, where each unit costs 2000 euro per month and, and low income households can't afford that. And that's um, well, part of the argument that was made for, for these um, new laws that are, are coming um, each year and where we, so in particular, the, the, the new law that is uh, in discussion at the moment, uh, how to or help or how, how to bring investors to build um, larger, larger uh, projects with more social housing units and, and these kinds of things. But the question is, do we really need to have these um, housing units that match low income households? So do we need to build uh, housing units for them or, or is there another way of, of reducing rents? And so what I want to mention here is that first time home buyers connect the rental and the owner occupied markets. And in Germany, 50% of all new built housing is bought by former renters. So people that move from renting to owning and most of them are first time home buyers. Most of them buy single family housing. And this also frees up rental housing units. And of course, these, these rental housing units are then available for other renters to be occupied. And, and, um, and I think many times these are renters that don't have very high incomes. And I'll show you some statistics, what the housing quality is of these uh, first time home buyers, what the housing quality of their last rental housing unit is. Okay, so what I have here is the, the uh, housing quality at the time of, of the move. Um, of somebody who moves into a new, uh, newly built owner occupier unit. So new, newly by, built single family housing unit. And as you can see, if, if that person is a renter and I have here 10 housing quality bins, um, that per, these households can come from all um, different types of housing units. So they can come from very high quality housing units that are probably very expensive on the rental housing market. But, but a substantial share of them also comes from um, very low quality or moderate quality housing units. So the, the rental housing units that they leave empty um, can have quite low quality, which is a good thing if you think about low income households that are trying to find um, housing units that have well, low quality is maybe a, a bad way of phrasing it, but these uh, units are obviously also cheaper and, and um, housing quality overall, even of, of very um, low quality housing units is, is relatively high uh, still in, in Germany. So this is still okay by, by any uh, standards. And well, part of it is, is depreciation. So if you move uh, into your rental housing unit and you live there for say five years, then at the time you move out, the, the unit has depreciated a bit. And uh, so that's the difference between the red line and the black line. But then the question remains, why are so many of these first time buyers living in relatively, um, well, housing units of relatively low housing quality? And I think um, the main reason for this is that they have very high moving costs. So people don't adjust their housing quality very often. And if you think about um, the typical first time home buyer who's maybe in the mid thirties, uh, that person might have, or that household might have lived in that rental housing unit for five or 10 years uh, in many cases. And the income of that person has increased probably over that period of time, just because of age effect, just because over that um, um, period of time in your life cycle, uh, people tend to, to have increasing incomes. And, and so when that person first chose the housing unit, the, the housing quality that they chose is, was relatively low. Okay, so and 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 that, that's a reason why why um, first-time home buy buyers need vacant units of relatively low quality. Often. Okay, so I'm going to skip this one, and then uh, empirically you can also see that if you look at the impact of new construction on low-quality rents, 
So just any type of new construction, not not um, new construction of of social housing, but market rate housing, then low quality rents um, also decrease. Uh, so the, the red vertical line is the new supply. And, and then you can see that after a few months, low quality or rents of low quality housing units decrease. Um, the same is true for, for the second quality bin that I have here, the low average quality. Um, for average quality, it takes a bit longer. And um, also, if you look at higher quality levels, you still see the same um, pattern, but, but it's uh, shifted a bit uh, to the right. So it takes a bit longer for, for rents to, to decrease. Okay, so this uh, suggests that, that it's not strictly necessary to build social housing in the strict sense of the word. It's uh, rather necessary overall to build housing. And it doesn't matter so much which types of units um, we build. It, it's more important that we build housing uh, overall. Okay. Then the, the related question is building, um, well, not just anywhere, but we also need to build housing in the right places. And I think this is where the core problem is. Uh, so I talked quite a bit about these productive cities uh, such as Munich. They attract workers, they are attractive for other um, reasons um, than well, workers that are, or people that are very productive also sort or like to, to live in these very um, big cities because they earn a lot of money and so can afford to live there. And, but this creates additional uh, demand for housing because these uh, types of um, people um, tend to live in bigger housing units. Um, so then it's not only housing, but also commercial real estate. The firms also need to, to occupy some space uh, in, um, in these bigger cities. Uh, so this also creates demand for, for land and uh, makes it more difficult to build housing. And then uh, on the other hand, we have incumbent, incumbent residents who live in these places and they don't really like to be, um, well, they, probably don't like it too much if their places become congested, if, if too many people come to their uh, city because this crowds the roads, um, public transport, parks, schools, and so on. And so landowners typically prefer sparse housing development because this maximizes land values. Well, then it's very, very good to have a house in this place and, and uh, to be one of these few people who have a house. And so your, your, house, your own house becomes very, very expensive. And also you don't have so many people around you, uh, which is nice if you're in, in a park. And so it's hard for politicians, for local politicians to, um, build, or to, to allow building um, or to allow developers to build very large housing units in these places. Uh, because the incumbent residents for, for these reasons have very strong incentives to lobby against housing development. And I think a very good example for Germany is Munich, which has a problem or um, is discussing or has discussed for decades whether they should have high rise buildings. And this is what is called a protected view from Monopteros to the city center. And you can see it's, it's a beautiful view. Um, and the only high rise buildings in here are churches and, and um, or some other older buildings that are not used for, for productive purposes or for, for housing purposes. And so Munich could also look like if they wouldn't have this uh, protected view and they could have high rise buildings for, for um, residential purposes, but also for, for firms. And it could also look like this maybe. So that will probably look more like an, uh, an American city, um, but Munich doesn't want that. And probably also for the reasons that I've been giving, given that uh, people already living in Munich, they don't like um, their city to be too crowded and they don't like these views to be destroyed because they already own a house in Munich. And so they don't need the rents to, to come down. Sorry, Andres, how they can influence, I mean, how they can uh, push uh, that they have not to build? People can influence 
that bigger houses are being built or yeah exactly well that's a, a oh, very good question they avoid that they are uh, building it well i mean i'm not saying that munich should be looking like this but i'm i'm just pointing out that this is the reason why prices are so high in munich yeah, but uh, why is not and, happening this is and yes i well i think it's not happening because the well, the voters of the politicians that are in Munich are people that live in Munich already, and people that might benefit from these high-rise buildings are people that want to move to Munich or that maybe um, rent in Munich. But but um, yeah, well, I, I think the larger share of, of the politicians in Munich caters to people that have lived in Munich for a long time because it's also more likely that these people are going to to be voters in the next election. And so I think it's very hard to, to do developments against this, um, this view. Yeah. OK. Because uh, I was thinking that it was independent. So I was thinking that basically the, well, at least in Italy, the amount of uh, mm -hmm. uh, building that you can uh, build in one city is not depends from the people that are living there. So basically, there is there are some offices that are uh, um, mm -hmm. deciding for this. Well, I, as far as I can tell, there's a lot of discussion about every single um, higher building that is planned for Munich, and it, people tend to not do it because well, it's it's costly, and if if you're uncertain as an investor that it's going to that you're going to be successful. Um, mm -hmm. Then you're probably not going to, to build that high-rise building and and if you feel that the politicians don't really push for it or well, don't give you certainty then it, it doesn't happen and then, then munich also has these moratoria and i'm going to show you in the next slide that well that there are quite a few of these new corridors in munich and what this means is that so this is what we just saw monopteros and the direction was to to Frauenkirche. And so the black dots are the high rise, um, or not high rise buildings, but buildings higher than the natural horizon line. And this is something that um, Munich, people in Munich try to protect, at least people that, that try to, um, that, that, that like Munich to be as flat as it is. And um, this includes churches and other historic buildings that can't be used for anything um, at the moment. At least the, the part of the building that is higher than the horizon line is typically not used for anything. So Munich is pretty flat and, and these lines in here are the view corridors and you, know, you can't build anything that's high in these view corridors and that's um, quite a large share of, of Munich. And so you can imagine that it's very hard for developers to build a lot of housing in Munich and, and to make Munich denser and higher. Uh, and so as a consequence, um, it's difficult to house that many people in Munich, but a lot of people want to live there. And also a lot of firms want to be there. And, and well, that's just a, um, something that doesn't go together very well. Andreas, do you know why these in Parkstadt Schwabing in north of Munich, there are two or three very high buildings, uh, but the rest is, as you say all the time, it's flat, flat and flat. How did they manage it? It's, I think it's uh, when you come in from the autobahn directly mm -hmm. at the side, there's a something new build and it's very, very, uh, how do you say, it's it's a double or something like this of the rest. It's a, it's and a it's a solitaire. Yeah. It's very strange, I think. Is this new or an older development? Uh, I think it's in the last 10 years. It's okay. not so new. It's, it's not so new, yeah. but it's not all very old. Well, I think te technically it's possible, but it's just very difficult politically, I, I think. Is that true? Is that your impression? Yeah, yeah. It's, but because it's just one building, it's just, it's mm -hmm. like, uh, I think it's a, a bureau complex or something like this. I don't know. I don't think it's it's apartment or housing, but it's mm -hmm. really solitary if you come in, in the north of Schwabing and then there's on the left side and that's all. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's very funny. I think you could have ten of these. It's the same uh, viewing, but uh, it's just the one. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay, so I, yeah, well, I'm just trying to, to make the point that, oh, sorry, that this is the reason why prices are so high and uh, it doesn't have to do with investors speculating about prices in Munich or trying to, to build housing that is, is bought up by, by people from Abu Dhabi or, or wherever. It's just because you, it's very difficult to build in Munich and, and a lot of people want to live there. And these two things together just have to lead to very high rents and prices. And the thing that could be done is to allow for more construction for denser development. I also want to mention that for Munich, it's, as a municipality, it's difficult because they only can control what's inside their borders and the municipalities around Munich are also part of, of that bigger problem because they also don't have incentives to allow for denser development, but that's maybe going too far for today. Okay, so let me um, come to an example from England where there's a, a very um, good paper by a colleague of mine, Christian Hilber and Walter from, from Eulen from 2016, and they have looked at house prices and how constraints to building new housing can explain a substantial share of the increase in house prices in England since 1974. And um, that's a long period of time, but, but the increase has also been quite dramatic. Uh, so this is average. So the average price in, in England, and it has come up from about 80,000 uh, pounds. So controlling for inflation from 80,000 pounds to 226,000 pounds average price. So including the countryside, it's not just London. And so what they do in their paper, they try to decompose this price increase into an increase that is due to the um, well, regulatory constraints to, to adding new housing units to the housing stock. So regulators trying to, to prevent the construction of new housing, and then to other constraints such as uh, the share of developed land. So if land is already developed, it's, it's obviously not possible to develop it again. Um, and then also to, to other constraints such as um, rugged terrain. So if, if the area is mountainous, then it's more difficult to build. Um, but they find that prices could be about 35% lower if the regulatory restrictiveness, so if um, the re regulatory restrictiveness was, was um, taken out completely. So uh, taking it out completely is a, is a far stretch, but, but still it shows that a large share of this, this large price increase is due to regulators trying to prevent uh, the construction of new housing. And, and this is in, well, to a large degree, the story that I was trying to tell for, for Munich that local residents lobby against new construction because they don't like their own neighborhood to be too crowded. And in England, the planning system is such that this is very easy to do for them. So they can um, exert um, political pressure on the people that, that decide about these development projects. And, and so it's, it's just a very good example of where this can go if you prevent developers from adding new, new housing to the housing stock and prices have to increase uh, tremendously. So the other um, parts are also important, but not as important. And then there's a, an overall increase that is also related to the financial market and so on that, um, that you can not prevent by adding housing supply. Okay, so but, um, in, the, in a recent study together with uh, Christian, we look at house prices, rents and, and housing supply and at the ratio of house prices to rents. And we also look at social rents. And I think this is an, uh, an interesting insight um, so when local housing markets are booming, then house prices increase much more strongly in places where building more housing is difficult. So in these places where people lobby against new housing, but rents also increase more strongly in these places, not as strongly as house prices, but, but still more strongly than in other places. And interestingly, social rents also increase more strongly in these places. So even though they're subsidized, um, it's still more costly to provide social housing in London than it is in, in the countryside. And because of that, these social housing providers also have to um, have to have higher social rents 
need to make up for, for this uh, difference because they also have to buy the land where they built their social housing units. So it's it's part of the problem that um, thinking back to Munich, um, it's difficult in, in Munich to build social housing because the land is so, so expensive. So it's just a matter of, of the costs then. Okay, so I want to propose a few things um, that could help, that are probably not politically feasible, but still it might be interesting to think about what, what would help. Uh, so I think one thing that is possible is to allow buildings to be a bit higher. People are afraid if you tell them, well, next year your neighbor's house is going to be three times as high as it is today. But if you say, well, in, in a bigger city where houses have three, four, five stories, well, adding one or two stories wouldn't be that bad for most people. So allowing a bit more density would, would still have or would already have large effects. And then I think one thing that would really help is the land value tax. That's something that we um, don't have. And two years ago, we had the opportunity to, to change our um, taxation of, of real estate and, and housing into a land value tax, but we didn't do it. Um, mainly because I think Bavaria lobbied against it and, and some other country, uh, states of Germany as well, federal states. Um, so, but that would be something that really helps because taxing land, depending on its value, forces people to use the land in the best possible way. And if you think about Munich, well, a single family home in central Munich, that exists at the moment, but if you have to pay a land value tax, you have to pay the tax on the land that this single family home occupies. And this, is, this could be a very, very large tax that would have to be paid. So this would become much more expensive. The parking lots would become much more expensive. So do, do we really need so much parking in the, in the central um, parts of the city or maybe at least parking lots that are not high rise or are not in uh, buried into the, into the ground. Um, so taxes, on the other hand, taxes for flats in Munich would be much lower because flats use up much less land. So you can have a lot of flats in, in a single building. And then also speculative investment in open building lots or in empty buildings would be much less attractive because you would have to pay the land value tax. And so what I would do is I would use the land value, the revenue from that land value tax and lower the income tax instead, because that's what hurts renters the most. They typically don't have that much capital because if they had capital, they, they would just buy their home. So they have to rely on their income from, from labor. And if they have to pay a high income tax, but on the other hand, rents are high, then it's, it's practically, impossible for them to, to save money and to, to build up the capital stock. And so that um, would help them a lot to be able to pay the rent. And as a consequence of uh, having higher income, higher income after tax, um, renter households in the Munichs of this world would be better off. Okay, so final slides, I'm taking a lot of time. But the final slide is on this uh, law that is under discussion at the moment, Bauland Mobilisierungsgesetz. So Building Land Act is maybe a translation. Um, and so what, there are four parts to, to this as far as I can tell. Uh, the first one is protection of renters from eviction and conversion of large residential buildings into owner, into owner occupied housing. Uh, so they want to prevent investors from buying rental housing and then converting it into owner-occupied housing. And, and there's probably going to be a, a threshold uh, where the federal state can decide at what number of units per, per house they um, put the threshold. And then if the building is larger than the threshold, then you can't do their conversion. Uh, so that's one thing. Um, just to put this into perspective and, and to, to know where it's coming from, Berlin, Berlin experienced about 18,800 conversions in 2020, 12,600 something in 2019. 
Uh, so that's a high number. Oh, but um, there was also rent control introduced in 2020, and probably that's the reason why there were so many conversions into owner occupied housing. And so, what I uh, would just like to mention here is that it's you'd always have to have demand for owner occupied housing to be able to transfer a rental housing unit into an owner occupied housing unit. So it's not that easy that you can say, well, it's always profitable for an investor to buy up rental housing units and to transfer them into owner, into owner occupied housing units. And um, so on the other hand, I, well, I would say protection from eviction is, is an important thing because for, for renters, it's, it's also important to, to be able to, to live at that place where, where they live for, for as long as they want to, as long as they pay the rent. Uh, but it's probably not going to going to help much in the overall um, to to solve the overall problem here, because the as I said the the main problem is that we don't have enough units overall. So that's the next point is more planning rights from municipalities. This goes more into the direction of being able to pr produce more units in areas without building plans uh, so that municipalities shall have the force or sh shall be able to force investors to build more units in these areas and to force them also to build subsidized rental housing units or um, rental housing units that, that is rented out um, at a discounted rate, is let at a discounted rate. So this shall solve the perceived problem that new construction is lux luxurious rather than affordable uh, as I pointed out earlier, uh, also the luxurious properties help to bring down rents, but uh, yeah, it, probably affordable units help even more, but it could also have the reverse effect. I think that's an interesting thing that that is difficult to tell from today's perspective. It could have the effect that there are fewer construction projects because investors are, are holding off and saying, well, if I have to build a lot of subsidized rental hardware, can build the type of units that I want to build and rather going to build elsewhere. Uh, it also reduces land values, probably because the landowner now has fewer options, cannot build what they want to build, but have to build something particular. And so that could be one incentive or one reason why the municipalities want to have that law, because then it's easier for them um, to um, to build social housing themselves, to, to buy the, the land and build social, social housing themselves. And this is the, the final bit that's probably going to have uh, large effects in, in some places. Well, there's preemption rights from municipalities, so they can decide to build certain types of housing units uh, if they want to, even if the investor wants to sell or the, the owner wants to sell to somebody else. And uh, typically they had to pay the actual offers that were that the owner had for that particular type of, type of, of object they, they wanted to sell. And now they um, probably only have to pay the, what is called Verkehrswert, which is typically lower. So it's sort of a, a way of making it cheaper for municipalities to buy up uh, housing units in their cities. But the, the overall problem here is that none of these, um, well, apart from the middle um, thing, none of these things is going to lead to more construction overall. And, and so it's not going to solve the, the main problem. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. Um, that's all I wanted to say today. So thank you very much for, for listening and I'm looking forward to, to any further questions if you have.